Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this improvement review as part of the College, Career, and Civic Readiness Networked Improvement Community. Um, we are really excited to have Jessica from the Big Picture team sharing the work that she's been engaged with with her team at Soledad Enrichment Action Downtown School. Um, so go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, I wanted to give just a quick overview of the protocol that we're going to be using today. We're going to start with about eight to ten minutes for Jessica and her team to share um, what they've been engaged in, share some of their improvement work, and pose a question for us to have some dialogue about and help them think through. Then from there, we'll move into five minutes of clarifying questions so we can kind of understand their dilemma and their context a little better. Seven minutes of probing questions where we get to kind of move a little deeper with our questioning. And then we'll have about 15 minutes where we're going to just discuss their dilemma and our ideas around it and possible next steps for them. Um, once we're done with that, we'll have Jessica and her team. They get the last three minutes to come back and reflect on what they heard, possible next steps. And it would be great, um, big picture team, if that, in, this, in this portion, if you could actually articulate some clear next steps, um, that would be fantastic. And then we'll take a little, a little bit of time time to debrief the process. So the norms that we're going to use um, for this discussion are hard on the content, soft on the people. We're going to be gentle with Jessica, but we're going to really try to push her thinking and that of her team. Um, kind, helpful, and specific. The more specific we can be in our celebrations and our suggestions, the more helpful it's going to be to Jessica and her team. And um, I'm going to be a very active facilitator online, as always a little wonky, um, so we're going to kind of embrace the silence, but I'm also going to do my best to integrate whips where I'm asking everybody to share, and I might just call on people or ask you to chat things into um, the chat box to get us rolling. So just be ready for that. I'm going to do my best to ensure that we're sharing the air and hearing from all voices. All right, so with that, we will let the big picture team take it away. So Jessica can begin with the, you want to talk about Soledad? Can you hear me? Oh, do we lose Jessica? I think we might have lost our presenter. <laughs> and can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Michael. Do you oh, want to okay. kind of sure. pick up and, and hopefully we'll get Jessica back? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, big picture. Great. Uh, has been around for 20 plus years and is uh, it's an approach in which the education is built around students' interests. And so instead of building a curriculum and changing the way uh, students have to be in relationship to that curriculum, it's putting students at the center one student at a time and building curriculum around that. A big a core pedagogy, a core move is to have internships uh, that are based on student interests. And so education is often based on authentic work with men mentors in the real world. Uh, Jessica? Did you get yes, that? we're having internet issues in our building. Okay, yeah. How about uh, introducing Soledad? I just talked a little bit about big picture. Oh, okay, great. Um, Soledad Enrichment Action is a small school spread out over 15 locations in LA. They primarily serve high at risk students such as kids who have been in drop, uh, dropped out of school, who have been in juvenile justice, or who are severely behind in credits. So the teachers um, at our school, prior to this, we had been um, LA Big Picture High School. And because of funding, we closed. And so now we're now with Soledad, and we're running the Big Picture model at one of their 15 sites. Great. So in the next uh, slide, so when we got together for the winter convening, uh, we identified as the problem, or Soledad identified as the problem that they wanted to tackle, was the students' lack of knowledge and skills to navigate institutional systems, uh, particularly college systems. And um, that came from previous PDSA cycles that occurred since our first convening, uh, which involved surveying students, uh, finding out what they thought um, about their future, um, what were their plans, and how did they think they were going to get there. And what was noticed at that time was a gap between uh, maybe an unrealistic self-appraisal, which was there was a lot of people wanting to go to a four-year college, but very little knowledge about how to get there or how to do that. So this is what landed us here at the winter convening with this problem. Uh, and so going through the protocols that we had there, we brainstormed a number of uh, 
root causes and categorize them. Some some are even in the notes section here because there weren't enough bones to fit it all. So there's a couple of others there. Um, and then using the high leverage uh, as well as practical markings, you can see that we have both on, on advisor knowledge base and academic skills and experience. So moving on to the driver diagram, uh, well, I'm going to go back to those two root causes in a minute. When we go to the driver diagram, we see that our aim is, the same, is uh, taking that problem and, uh, and improving upon it. And we wrote down a number of primary drivers, the what, and I put in red the line, the chain of thinking that went here. So those root causes I mentioned before seem to be addressable through curriculum and instruction. So that was the primary driver we were going to lean into. Uh, one noticing on the survey was a gap in knowledge about financial literacy and getting into college. And another was having the right tools to manage transition to college. So you can see how it leads down to these change ideas, which is to offer financial literacy workshops and to create a post-secondary planning tool that could then be monitored to help with, uh, used as a tool to manage transitions. So Soledad went on on the next, uh, adopting those two change ideas, both leaning into the curriculum and instruction driver. And this is where um, Jessica can pick up on the PDSA cycles that they were running at Soledad as a result of this theory of action. Sorry, I'm trying to still get my computer to stop freezing. Uh, okay, so... Yeah, based on what Michael was talking about, um, what we've noticed, we decided to try two change ideas, one of which was running a financial literacy seminar at our school, uh, which we've done every year, but we decided to expand it this year and put some more research behind it. And the second was to uh, have our kids start implementing a post-secondary plan. Um, and that's actually a multi, multiple PDSAs, and we did the, that first one. So we've done two PDSAs so far and have two to follow up on. I don't know if we move on. Okay. So our first PDSA uh, took place last Saturday on the 6th. So our premise, as Michael mentioned, is that we think students and parents are not knowledgeable about the financial aid process. I mean, a lot of that's come from empathy interviews, but also from the data we've actually collected where they say they're not aware. And in the past, we've also had students not attend college, even though they were accepted because of financial aid issues. So we invited the whole, the all 11th and 12th grade, which is very small at our school. We had the students and the parents fill out a pre-survey before the workshop, and then we did a cash for college workshop where students filled out the FAFSA. They learned all about how to take out grant, or how to take out loans, what grants are, what scholarships were, and how to apply for the Cal grant. And then after the workshop, we had them do a post-survey, and so we had 13 people, including parents, complete the first survey, but only 10 in the second because we split into two rooms for Spanish and English, and some people had left without taking the, the second one. So that was our first PDSA. And up next is some data about it. So we'll just go through these really quick. Um, these are Google charts, so they can be a little confusing. If you look at the actual numbers rather than the chart, it's a little easier to understand. So the top chart is before the workshop, and the bottom chart is after. So you can see that um, we asked them, should you follow the FAST for each year you enroll? And at first, people were, um, there was eight people that weren't sure, but after the workshop, almost everyone was sure that that is true. Um, you want to keep going on the slides? I'm just going to go through these really quick. So um, this one asked if they understood the financial aid process, and no one strongly agreed with that. We had four agrees, and afterwards we had five agrees and two strongly agrees, so we thought that was a big improvement. And this is uh, understanding the difference between grants, loans, and scholarships, because many people at our school didn't understand that loans had to be paid back or didn't understand that grants were free money. So you can see that was um, not a huge difference in that one. You had went from one strongly agreed to two. So some of the takeaways from our first, first PDSA, um, we actually thought that afterwards uh, parents and students were a little more nervous about the college process. I think they actually felt pretty overwhelmed by it. We had some empathy interviews afterwards, and 
especially the younger students, the 11th graders expressed that they didn't realize it would be that complicated and they were now feeling more stressed out. So we think they're maybe a little more realistic in terms of they saw how much colleges actually cost. A lot of students were like, I didn't know it cost that much to go to a private school. Um, but I, we do feel that they're more knowledgeable. Um, and I did not see a significant difference. And we think that's because direct teaching, which is how the workshop was set up, isn't actually the best format for a lot of our parents and students. It was just too much information all at once directly taught. And we need to do a little bit more hands-on other than just the FAFSA. So our second PDSA was a post-secondary plan. So we in the fall, as Michael probably talked about um, when I had internet issues, we did a, a survey with our entire student body and almost every student at our school said, I'm going to a four-year college. And then you would ask them, can you envision yourself there? And they're like, no. Or do you know why you want to go? No. Do you know how to get there? No. Do you know the requirements? No. But I'm definitely going. And so we kind of realized we've, over the years, have created this like you have to go to a four-year culture at our school without enough training about how to do it or really the other options. So we decided that we would have kids as our, our first cycle just tell us what is your plan. And then after we saw that plan, we would then um, ask them to explain why and then actually educate them more about the options and then reassess them and say, well, do you still have that same plan? So. At our school, we have something called a learning plan where students identify all their academic goals for the semester, and that's in their courses, their project work, and non-cognitives. And so at the bottom of it, on the next slide, you'll see we just added a very simplistic box. After graduation, my plan is four-year college, community college, job, internship, or other, and then because. And we gave them no prompting. So we wanted just them, based on what they've heard, like what would they put. So these were our outcomes. So there were 18 students that um, ended up filling out this form because it was just a one-day attempt. And of those 18 students, 12 of them put that they were going to a four-year for sure. And three put that they were going to a community college, and you can see the breakdown. So this was um, surprising because uh, uh, about half of these kids are severely behind in credits and have a GPA of 2.5 or lower. Many of them have a GPA below t a 2. But we're like, I'm going to a four-year college. So that was definitely one of our findings. Sorry, I want to, so you, sorry, <laughs> you go to the next slide. Um, our takeaways from this, as you can see, a majority of students said they planned on attending college, and then I have a lot of data about their whys were typed up, and many students said, actually, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm supposed to. I don't know what school I would go to. I don't know what I'd major in. Um, and so, once again, we feel like we've kind of unintentionally made this, like, college for sure environment where um, College or four-year right away isn't realistic for all of our students, or like the pathway hasn't been made clear to them if it is realistic. And then we noted that all three of the students that chose two-year said, I'm really not ready for a four-year, and it stresses me out, but I feel like I'm supposed to go to a four-year right away. <clears throat> so our next steps is we would like to create um, a school-wide financial aid literacy curriculum, because in the past it's really been focused on just the seniors. And when we noticed we did the workshops, our seniors felt great after the workshop, but our juniors and our junior parents were super stressed out. Like, why have we never heard this information? I never even knew about there were different kinds of loans. I didn't know about government loans versus private loans. So we want to create and implement a school-wide financial aid workshop for students and parents and then resurvey. And we want to create and implement a curriculum for post-secondary planning and mm -hmm. resurvey students and see if their, their choices change from four-year to anything else or if they say four year, but they know how to get there and why. So there's some uh, typos here, but uh, sorry about that. But So we want to know if, um, how do we know if what we're trying to test for is actually based on the actions we took? We're not actually sure if like these students, like we're, it's our hunch that students are answering this way because of what we've implemented at our school or like kind of the, the, the school college going culture we have, but we're not actually sure why. So we want to make sure that when we do these surveys that we're, make, we're collecting data, I'm not wording this well, that the, the students' responses actually correlate with what we've been doing. So I'm like, do you actually understand this, work, this information more because of the workshop or is it because you read on your own or something like that? So, and how are we measuring that? 
So that's kind of our, our focus. We're not really sure we're measuring these things accurately. If that makes sense. Okay. okay. Great. I think I have a little bit of an echo, but there it goes. All right. Fantastic. So thank you very much, Jessica and Michael, for sharing um, your dilemma and your context. We're going to take five minutes now of clarifying questions. And these are those questions that are brief, factual answers. Um, Jessica or Michael should be able to basically answer them without even having to pause. The they're literally questions like, how many students did you try this change idea with, as an example. So what would be great is if we could all just take about five seconds and think of a clarifying question that we might have that's going to help us engage with their question and type that into the chat box. And while we do that, I'm actually going to ask Ryan to go ahead and go back a slide so that we have the focus questions um, up for us as we're trying to think of clarifying questions. So feel free to chat those into the chat box. And it sounds like we're really trying to hone in on how can we measure what we're after and how will we know if what we're actually doing is having the impact we hope it is. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> and for, those so, of you, for those of you who are viewing, please feel free to post in the G Plus uh, window or use the Q&A function, and I'll happily post those questions in for our panelists. Fantastic. Okay, so it looks like we've got some questions rolling in. How about let's start with Rob. Rob, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, I'm unmuted, but can you hear me? We can, yes. Oh, that is so cool. All right. <laughs> yeah. I had two questions. One is uh, how many students do you have overall? And the second was I have a question about advisory groups and how they are structured. Uh, are they by uh, heterogeneous by age? So our school is very small. We only have 51 students. Okay. Tiny school. Um, we focused on with both of these PDSA cycles. We originally surveyed the entire school to get background information, but then we pulled out just the 11th and 12th grade students. So that's only 18 students at our school. And the advisory and the structure um, prior to this year was always grade level. This year it's completely mixed. So my advisory, which a lot of this was done through my advisory, is uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Thank you. Great, Jennifer, you're up. Jessica, this is so exciting. <laughs> I'm really impressed with all the stuff you've already done. Um, my question was about um, the workshop, like what uh, percentage of eligible, you know, the target juniors and seniors actually attended the workshop? Okay, well, we had four seniors, and we only have four seniors, so that's 100%. <laughs> and um, juniors, I know, right? Juniors, do we have, um, okay, let me think, eight. Nine. We have ten juniors, and five of them attended. Okay, Two thank of you. Are, are taking the workshop at a separate date because they had to work and they could not be there, and three just didn't come. Okay, great. And it looks like I completed it by now, but their date is not on here. And Jose has got a question. I suspect you might have just answered it, which is, what grade levels are you focusing on, juniors and seniors? It sounds like are the target. Yes. Okay, great. We'll, we'll look forward to hearing Jose's voice during the probing questions then. And Nick, would you like to pose your question? Yeah. Um, so do you also have ninth and 10th graders at your school? And yes. do most of your students arrive to your school undercredited? That, um, that's, that's kind of complicated. Uh, so we do have ninth and 10th graders at our school. Very few ninth. I think there's only like three or four. I'm not totally sure. Um, prior to this year, like I said, our school closed in in June, and when it, our school had almost 100 students then, and when it closed, uh, our students all transferred to other schools, and then we kind of got picked up by this other school, Soledad, and 40 of our students came with us, but they were all we, so we had no ninth graders. So since then, we've picked up a few ninth graders um, that have transferred in, but. We didn't have a location for a long time, so it's been a very strange school year. Mm -hmm. um, so the kids that came with us are not very far behind in credits, with the exception of a few. The 10 to 12 that have, I think it's probably actually more like 12 that have come in, um, are very behind in credits. So the kids that transfer in this year are very behind. Our prior kids had not been, which is right. most of our junior seniors. All right. Deezy, you're up. You're up. Did you call my name? 
uh, Daisy, but she might okay. be frozen, so go ahead, Rob. Uh, let's see. Oh, are the internship mentors involved in any way in discussions and planning and so on? Of, of, of what exactly? Uh, uh, in, in discussions about around college and college readiness and what college is about. Yes, because the internships at our school, it's one-to-one. -one. So if students have a mentor, we do ask them to talk about it, and they do. But right now, most of our students are not seniors or juniors. They're in 10th and 9th grade, so those do service learning. So they're in a group mentor program, and so they haven't been talking about college, just the older students. Okay. I mean, they're, to their mentors, they haven't talked about college. Thank you. Great. And actually, Daisy is joining me, so she gets to ask her question from here. Thanks. Sorry, Rob, I'm having the same problem you had last time. Um, yeah. So where do you plan to implement the financial literacy into the curriculum? Just is it We're planning on doing it with all grade levels and all advisories, because advisory in the big picture model, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is where students actually spend most of their time. It's not homeroom. It's actually um, it's actually where the students' project work is connected to all of their courses. So you're with that one teacher for a majority of the school day, um, and so really most of your curriculum, other than some of your core courses, comes from that one place. So we're going to implement the financial literacy curriculum into all grade levels, all advisors. Which right now is only three classes. Great, and we have one last clarifying question from Kira, and then we'll move on to probing. Go ahead, Kira. Uh, so I was just curious about the college plan and uh, whether this you have implemented it at all the grade levels, or you just started with the seniors, or what, or if the plan is to start with the seniors and then build it up, or if, right if there has so, been any review in the past. So we have we are done we have done it with everyone already, but. Uh, this presentation was made like four days ago, and so the data hadn't been collected for them. So this is just the data for the 11th and 12th. We were doing it for the whole school. And so but this is the so first thing we asked ask them to put in the learning plan. Usually it's kind of a... Uh, 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 <laughs> it is part of, uh, um, of interviews with the advisor. Now we're making them formally type up their plan every year. And that is new, and it will continue. We're starting it very basic because we want them to do it without any input from us. Like, just off the top of your head, what's your plan? And then we're going to implement curriculum and then ask them, to, would they revise their plan or not? But everybody. Great. Okay, so now we can move on to probing questions. And... Those are those questions that we can dig a little deeper with. Um, and so these are also the ones that we want to be sure that we're avoiding advice in disguise. So questions that start to sound like, have you thought about or have you considered? Um, save those ideas for the discussion that will come next. But some great probing questions are things like, what challenges do you, do you anticipate have you already encountered? Um, how do you see this connecting back to your aim? What surprised you? Um, those sorts of questions. So we can dig a little deeper now. Um, and again, I'm going to have Ryan go back to um, the focus questions so that we can really try to orient our probing questions towards ones that are going to help us with the dilemma that Jessica shared with us. So again, I would love to have folks just chat any questions that are emerging into um, the chat box, and I will call on you. And if anybody's having trouble getting to the chat box, then also feel free to just raise your hand if you've got something, and I can um, questions have you in. To, um, the chat box, and I will call on you. And if anybody... Great. And again, we have Rob leading off the pack. So let's have Rob pose his question, and I'd love to have some other folks roll their questions in as well. And if I don't see any, just so you know, I'm going to call on Pierre and then um, Kira and then Jennifer. Okay, my question is that uh, you, you've said that your students feel pressure that they need to go to four-year college. I'm wondering what your hopes are for your students uh, regarding four-year college. Well, just regarding four-year college or post-secondary plans in general? Uh, well, four-year college, since that's, that's what they feel pressure about. Um, well, my hopes are that students um, 
know how to go to get into a four-year college, what the requirements are, how to navigate that system, um, and that they, I guess I'm hoping students can set realistic goals for themselves and choose where they want to go. I want students to be able to know how to get there, apply, get accepted, and then choose whether or not they want to go, rather than, oh, I can't go because I wasn't accepted because I didn't know how to navigate that system, or I didn't know the requirements. Thank you. Great. And Jennifer, go ahead and come on up to your question. Hey, Jessica. Um, I know that uh, when we present, you, pre you and Michael presented the um, fishbone and um, the driver diagram, there was a emphasis sort of around curriculum for advisors. And I know that this is sort of the beginning talk of the um, financial literacy and planning piece of the curriculum. But I guess my question is, um, how will you be able to get all of the advisors kind of implementing this with fidelity sort of the way you are with your advisory? Like, have you really thought about, like, how you can roll this out across the school in a way that um, the experience your students are having is mirrored in the other advisories as well? Well, one of the ways that we have been thinking about that, luckily our school is so small, there's only two other advisories other than mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that makes it... Um, definitely simpler because I can talk to them about it. Um, but I've already spoken with them and they're really on board. They want it. We already have a college curriculum for all grade levels. We just haven't included that much financial aid. Mm -hmm. And we already go on college tours together as a whole school two to four times a year. But we have these things called pick-me-up groups which are led by uh, student, like usually older students and they meet every week and what, whenever we want a program to be implemented with fidelity, we do it through them. So actually, rather than the onus being on the advisors, we have our older students implementing this. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to really train the older students to then work with younger students about financial literacy, as well as the advisor being there. But that's really the goal. We put a lot of that on the students, if that makes well, sense. That's very big picture of you. It's also just, I'm tired, so. <laughs> All right, Pierre, thank you for your question. It looks like Pierre is digging, helping us dig into the first focus question that Jessica has posed. Right. I was wondering if you have some, like, so you, you've asked this question about whether or not your actions are what's impacting the students, and I was wondering yeah. if you have some suspicions that something else is, in fact, the, 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 like the cause. Well, I think... Producing the result that you're seeing. Right. That's a great question, actually. Um, we do have some suspicion about that. Obviously, um, I think last year we had a really big push with college at our school before it closed. But like I said, we have a lot of mostly the same students. But we had um, our students, inter first they interviewed an alumni from our school that either was home for break or Skyped in. And they interviewed the students who were in a four-year about their non-cognitives. And they were tr hypothesizing whether or not having like excellent non-cognitive or metacognitive skills made them successful in the four-year. So every student in our school interviewed an alumni that way. And then they went to a four-year college campus and they had to interview 15 people on a college campus and do the same thing. And they did these huge reports and studies and I feel like as a result of that, um, that was the pressure, but the new kids coming in, that had been our original premise, but now our new kids coming in who we didn't have are also saying that. So I kind of a and thinking it could be just kind of a cultural thing in general right now with parents and there's kind of a, a college for all culture which I think is great but without a lot of education behind it. So that's kind of where we're coming from. We thought it was from us but then we're seeing new students um, having the same um, response and also with the financial aid. They're talking to people other than us so we don't know if we're helping them or someone else is helping them. Like one of our students had already attended a financial aid workshop the week before, so I don't know like what helped him that workshop or our workshop. Great, great. And I think, and I think Kira, Kira has a question that, that she suspects might be similar to what Pierre just asked, but I think it might be a little bit different. So Kira, I'm going to have you ask your question anyway, and if Jessica thinks it's different, she can answer it. Well, I feel like she, um, Jessica just touched on that at the very end, but I was curious uh, just what were, like, what were, what was kind of feeding into this idea that you might not be measuring the right thing? 
or that your measurements might not be capturing what, what it is that you want to capture? Well, I think it's just, I feel like so much of it is assumption based. I mean, I guess it's it, the, with assessment in general and teaching, you kind of always wonder that. Um, I just kind of was like, when we did the first survey, we gave them tons of questions. I mean, Jennifer helped us create this amazing, very long survey, all about where do you see yourself after high school and all these things. And we realized, like, all of the questions have been, like, multiple choice. Like, there hasn't been enough um, qualitative information. So we're really, we are making, we're connecting the dots ourselves. So we did some empathy interviews to try to make it more sure, but we're just not sure. Like, I'm assuming that they want a four-year because of what we said, but maybe they really do just want a four-year. I don't know if I've actually pressured them into it accidentally. I just am not sure. I just have a hunch about it because I don't have enough qualitative information. Great. And we're going to end with two last probing questions from Nick and Jose. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so you mentioned that your students have low GPA and many are undercredited. I'm wondering, do you think that's the biggest barrier for them to get into college and want to go? Um, I actually don't think that's the biggest barrier. For some of them, especially the ones that have like a 2.5 and things like that, there are plenty of schools they can get accepted to, and some of them already have. The biggest barriers tend to be more like navigating the system, which is why that was uh, on our fishbone. Like they really don't, um, they get stuck with paperwork, financial aid, um, and even just uh, convincing their parents they can go. And then a lot of it's also skills-based. You know, if they attend a California State University, they have to be placed based on a t uh, placement test in the math and English. And a lot of them they put into remedial math. And then they get very disheartened by that because they're having trouble getting accepted to freshman level college math. And then they get stuck in a cycle where then the college will ask them to take a year off to go back to community college. And then it's just, it becomes a whole cycle. So it's, I think it's skills and navigating systems more so than the GPA. Great, thank you. And Jose, you get to close out the probing questions. All right, I feel excited. Hey, Jessica. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi. Well, I was, I was just kind of curious, like, you know, how, how are you guys currently kind of connecting that, the learning plan to your overall aim? And then also just if, if the students are seeing the benefits of, you know, using that learning plan. Um, how are we connecting the, the learning plan the kids fill out to our overall aim? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Um, well, our goal is for them to see eventually, that's where we're starting at, like, that's our first revision. We're going to much more revise the learning plan to be way more specific. We left it very vague on purpose for the first PSA cycle because we kind of wanted to show them our results and say, look, this many of you said you want to go to four-year, but you can't even say why. Let's talk about that. Um, so we're hoping that they'll be able to eventually ex explain on their learning plan what their next steps are and how to get there and why they want them, which directly goes with our aim of navigating those systems. Um, I'm sorry, you had a second part of that question that I forgot. I, I, I was just kind of curious um, what the students thought of, of the learning plan. Like, oh, was it helpful? Well, we've been doing the learning plan. Uh, that's part of the big picture model. So this is our 10th year using the learning plan. And I find that most of I guess it depends how it's implemented. Um, the advisors that implement it um, fully and have kids constantly reference it and revise it all the time. Uh, it's incredibly helpful because it's very metacognitive. It gets kids to think about um, what their specific goals are for every course and what they need to focus on, what their areas of growth are. Um, so for my classes, it's been very, very powerful. And all of my students do them and all of them use them, and including the new students in my class. But there are some new advisors to our school that had never had that, so they're struggling a little bit. So that's why, once again, I'm having these smaller groups of students from my class they go in and work with those new students and they help them with their learning plan alongside the advisor since they're actually more experts in it than, than the new advisor is. Great. Thank you, everybody, for those fantastic questions. So good. at this point, we are actually going to um, ask Jessica and Michael, the BP team, to kind of disengage a little bit. Not entirely, though. They're going to be listening in, taking notes. There is a note-taking document that we'll post the link to, again, in the chat box. Um, and if anybody has ideas, resources, suggestions, please feel free to open up that document and add any of um, those insights there. But we're going to move into the discussion portion. So we're going to take the next 15 minutes.
minutes to really try to do our best to uh, put our heads together around these focus questions. So uh, how do we know if what we're doing is actually having the impact that we hope it is um, in the midst of all these other things that could be affecting it? And how do we actually measure what we're after? And before we start to dig into those questions, we're going to just do a quick round of celebrations. So I would love to have um, five slides just to get us going. Um, so I'm actually going to nominate a couple people to get us going. I would love to have Rob um, and Pierre kick us off with celebrations and then have three other people kind of join in and you can just chat your name or your celebration into the chat box. But we'll kick it off with Rob and Pierre. Yeah, if I blank out, it's because my, my program is crashing again and again and again. But anyway, um, I would celebrate the, uh, I think that your your aim is the right aim. I mean, to, to kind of not only figure out about uh, students navigating the system, but also I was really impressed the way that you're concerned for the students getting and doing what is best for them and really, really matches up best uh, for them. Both secondary, yes, for your college they need to be prepared, but what's best for them? Right. Um, here. I would add that, I, you know, I think that that aim is fantastic. I think that um, regardless of, I mean, I, I know that you're concerned that maybe it's not your actions that are necessarily producing this impact, but at least the data you showed from your financial literacy workshops seem to indicate that they're certainly learning more about what they need to know, and that is I mean, even if it wasn't as direct result of your workshop, that's really that's really fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome, great, and we've got three more celebrations. How about Jennifer, Kira, then Daisy? Um, Jessica, I'm always so impressed with your work, and I uh, really feel one of the things that I think is really important about this whole NIC is the way that this work can impact um, other schools that are part of this organization. And I'm really hopeful and excited that we'll be able to. I don't know if you guys can hear it. There's a seven-year-old screaming about his bath on the other side of the store. <laughs> um, I'll be on mute soon. Um, but I think that uh, I'm excited to try to um, be instrumental in like how we can roll out a lot of these practices to our larger organization because I think what you're doing is really well aligned with our network goals. And, um, and I'm just grateful for your work. Great. Kira. Um, yeah, I just want to celebrate that you and your team were really intentional about collecting data before and after the workshop, and um, and I and like involving the parents in that in that uh, workshop and, and and giving them kind of a voice. I really like that. I really liked seeing the graphs; they were great. <laughs> and Daisy. Yeah, I just wanted to celebrate the work that's been done already around those personal learning plans and the fact that that's something utilized in your advisories on a regular basis. And I think that's phenomenal. All right, awesome. So let's go ahead and put those focus questions back up on the screen. If you're not seeing them, you can just click where it says High Tech High and they will soon be there. Um, but this is the time now for us to just dig into what are our ideas for helping Jessica and her team think about how can they measure what they're after, knowing their larger aim is around ensuring that all skill, all students have kind of the knowledge and skills to navigate this transition. So what are some things that would indicate that they do or that they're making progress? Um, and do we have any ideas on how they could know if their actions are actually having the impact that they hope? So I'm going to leave it open for 30 seconds. And then after that, I'm going to start calling on folks um, to contribute some ideas and just a heads up Nick I'm gonna start with you unless somebody else intervenes right yes unless Rob saves you uh, Rob good uh, at saving people <laughs> no I just have something that uh, really struck me uh, which is that uh, the, um, Jessica's uh, notion that they that the um, information needs to be qualitative um, and I think that uh, you know you got multiple choice and this and that, but you need the voices of students, as you know. Um, and I'm wondering about the personal learning plan and, the, and the, that those start from passions. Um, and what are your passions or what are your interests? Um, and I'm wondering if if the conversation about college readiness also needs to kind of circle back to that um, and uh, um, and and get student testimony around those and see. I mean, it's not only that these workshops might have an impact on 
uh, on one's feeling of readiness, but also on one's sense of interest and one's sense of one's passions. Those may be impacted as well. It's all part of the same package. Great. Thank you, Rob. How about Jennifer? Um, I was thinking about uh, different practices within an advisory that could be helpful for gathering some of this data around impact. Um, I know I'm assuming that there's a pretty active one student advisor one-on-one -on -one practice at Soledad um, and or advisory circles and if it's possible that those might be the places to kind of collect some of that qualitative data um, and get more specific at uh, how students are thinking and um, what's impacting their thinking. It's such a limited number of students. I mean, because the student group is so small, I'm kind of wondering why, um, if it's like kind of like in advisory or in or it, in an, in another format. If it's if some of the questions about like what has sh you know what shapes your vision of going to college and what shapes like where where are you gathering information just can't be asked directly because it's it's really not that large of a group. I mean, that's not scalable, of course, but for their in this in this small setting where they're kind of really trying out these processes, it doesn't it doesn't seem like that would be all that unmanageable. Great, yeah. How about Nick? And I'm putting just so you know in the chat, I'm thinking Nick, Kira, Jose, Daisy is how we're going to go next. Yeah, so uh, I, I I definitely would echo. I'm kind of thinking of two things. One, I would echo Rob's sentiments around like how does this like how are students internalizing this process as, as part of their story. And, and so, and then the other thing I think about is how, like are there ways, I'm wondering if there are ways to measure how students navigate systems, uh, as you kind of indicated that being one of your, what are your bigger barriers. And I wonder if, are there already some systems that students all navigate already, and how do we, or how do you kind of figure out what those are? I don't know what those are either, but I mean, I, I want, I, kids do complicated things, and I wonder how can you, Figure out what those things are and, and try to try to measure those. Great, I love the idea of building off strengths. Awesome. How about um, Kira and then Jose and Daisy? Yeah, I don't. I guess I'm having a harder hard time kind of formulating what I'm thinking about right now. Um, it it seems like the team is really um, struggling with. Uh, like understanding the impact of, of these like smaller workshops that they're doing, um, partially by looking at the data, but then all partially by kind of having this idea, uh, sort of like projection of where the kids are going to go based on where the kids in the past have gone. Um, and I don't know that that's necessarily to me that to me it seems a little bit like kind of I don't know jumbled or or like hard to follow. But I wonder. Um, along the lines of like Rob's suggestion around interest, if there's a way to kind of bring the people, the, the like graduates and like the students that have kind of gone out into the world and and bring them into this experience that the, that the current students are having and have this kind of like cross-generational conversation that can um, maybe like surface like in actual data some of the things that are difficult not some of the things that, or some of the things that are difficult based on the, like the kids who have come, already gone through the process. Um, okay. and, and then also kind of build in some support structures for these students who have not yet experienced those things that are difficult. Great. All right, Jose and Daisy, but feel free to pass too. I think we have other people who will, who will enter in. So um, I was also kind of thinking about just kind of like how to leverage that learning plan to kind of allow students' passions to come out, kind of like you know what, what's been already kind of discussed. But I also think about too like within that learning plan, like are there possible like are there ways to get I guess parents or even like community kind of input into you know in like you know in, in that process. Like I'm I'm almost thinking about like you know. In terms of, you know, if we think about, like, navigating the system, I think part of that is, like, you know, also being able to code switch, being able to kind of, you know, be able to, like, live in these, in, in multiple cultures. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about, like, at what, like, how can that start to be embedded in this conversation around learning plans? Um, so. Daisy. Yeah, this builds on, I think, a lot of what 
um, has been mentioned before. So those that idea of you've got a really small group, so being able to just have these conversations and maybe even thinking about the conversations as your change idea um, and less in terms of like are we tracking before and after. Um, one of the things it brings up is when we reached out to a lot of our alums from high to high that hadn't gone on to colleges to ask their perspective, it all of a sudden triggered a bunch of them saying, hey, actually, I'm a I am interested in going to college. It's been a couple of years, and would you help me navigate the process? And it was almost like the, the act of reaching out and having that conversation was impactful. Um, so maybe there's some way to use the personal learning plan that Jose was mentioning and these kind of conversations um, and use that as your change ideas. Cool. And we have a comment from Jennifer. Um, Jennifer, do you want to elaborate on that? And then Gab. Abby, you've been kind of having some tech issues coming in and out, but if you have something to contribute, we'd love to hear from you after Jennifer. I was just going back to uh, uh, Nick said something about sort of the t students telling the story of their experience and navigating these systems, and I was thinking also um, Bonnie in um, Highline had a lot of success with non-cognitives as part of exhibition and sort of um, listening actively during student exhibitions for uh, indicators that uh, they're showing non-cognitive growth. And I think it might be possible to, um, like we've had a lot of, a lot of these comments have been about um, really listening closely to students and we're dealing with a small number of students, so like different ways that we can pull qualitative data uh, and hear from them. And the exhibition practice might be a natural fit for this too. Um, both in terms of maybe providing some basic prompts for students for the exhibition, but also just listening actively and like like seeking out some of these pieces that you're trying to gauge as like that could be one of the places to go to look for them. Great. And Gabby, do you have a thought you'd like to contribute? Sorry, I feel like I've missed the entire thing. I really apologize. Okay. I got on the and then my tech just kind of keeps coming in and out. So I was taking a glance through the, the slides right now. I'm not sure where the conversation is. I, I have a lot of ideas on like how to, we. I mean, what we do a lot at CAT is make sure that students are applying and getting in. And so there's definitely like suggestions that I can make around like parent conferences and um, parent nights and what those things can look like. And I'm happy to share those drop in like links into the notes. Um, Great. I don't know how, like I said, I feel like I've missed a lot of the conversation, so I apologize, but I'm happy to put those in there. That would be fantastic. And I just want to share too, there's a couple to, to the questions, and if it's possible to put the slide up with the questions again, I just want to return us to those questions in the last two minutes. Um, and and a, a thought that I had that I've seen, we've been trying to keep track of similar data at High Tech High. I think we've been finding some, um, it's been interesting to track things like confidence level or feelings of belongingness, kind of how those are shifting as a result of the various things you're trying. So you can have a really nice, clean, scaled question that you're asking kids after each thing you're trying and seeing what's happening to like shifts in confidence level in, in their awareness of the process or how comfortable they feel navigating it or just do they feel like they belong in college? Is that changing as a result of what you're doing? And then I also was thinking it'd be great to put you in touch with um, the group from High Tech High North County who's developed a really interesting system in their advisory that they're using to basically track every benchmark along the way of a kid applying to college. And the advisors are tracking those things and, and continually touching base with the students about where they are in that process. But it's a really simple Google Doc that they created just so that they could keep track of where kids are. You might already have something like that, but we could we could share what, what's happening in our schools too. So we have about one more minute. If, if there's any other questions, suggestions, kind of resources that folks want to share or further ideas. It just occurs to me that, uh, and I hope I'm not repeating anything, I've been in and out, but um, that uh, part of the business of thinking ahead to college is about whether this is a place where I can feel I belong and so forth. And I was just thinking back to when I was running an internship program in Cambridge where the kids were working in elementary schools. It was situated, uh, our, our seminar meetings were on Leslie College. And I think, and those kids went to college. And I think the biggest factor in their going to, in deciding that they were going to college was the college snack bar at Leslie. Uh, college that they they spent time and breaks in the snack bar and they said wow this is college life I can deal with this <laughs> <laughs> I love that that's a great that's a great note to send us off on just have them experience the college snack bar perfect 
<laughs> All right. So we're going to invite Jessica and Michael. Feel free also to kind of join in, and we'd love to hear your um, takeaways. It'd be great if you could identify a couple like clear next steps um, that you might be interested in taking based on the conversation, because then we could always check back with you and see how those steps are going later. But the next three minutes are yours just to reflect on what you heard and where you're going to go with it. Okay. Um, I lost a bunch of it, unfortunately. I had to actually switch computers. I was out for a while. Um, it can, my, the internet's not working, so I didn't hear everything, unfortunately. Um, I hope Michael did. Yeah, I can. Uh, I, I think something that um, is great to do, and I'm starting to do it now by putting it in bold in the notes, is that embedded in that whole conversation are either a number of other drivers that could enrich our driver diagram, such as their passions and interests. That's been mentioned three or four times. Mm -hmm. And or and or change ideas, like integrating non-cognitive uh, reflection into the exhibitions. So I feel there's lots of uh, pieces embedded in here. In and then the other thing is that there's resources coming, you know, from Kat. Uh, Gabby's already putting some information in here. Um, but just in terms of enriching the um, model that describes what we're looking at has been extremely useful and the next action would be to collate those, enrich the driver diagram, and then have the team reflect on it to see if there's any new ideas. Um, I think from what I did hear, um, which was great, every, everything was great, um, is I really liked, uh, sorry, I'm trying to take notes at the same time. Um, Nick talked about how do you measure um, students navigating things and what systems are they already navigating that we could use like a template for about how to measure. So that's something is next steps that I would like to look into, thinking about like how do you measure like ability to navigate a system. So it's really looking into that um, and talking to students about that. I thought that was really awesome. Thank you so much for that, Nick. Um, and a lot of people talked about having more conversations and advisory circles and more empathy interviews, which is something we've been doing. I want to keep doing. I'm really excited about that. Um, a lot of the stuff that was mentioned is stuff we already do, and I feel like I was maybe remiss in like sharing some of that. Uh, like most, a lot of the things like we do NCVs is a huge part of our exhibitions. I worked, I worked with Body on the NCVs for the past two and a half years, but that's a huge part of our school culture um, and our exhibitions and post-secondary plan. Learning plans is 100% based on their interests and passions already and parents and community members and mentors have to meet with us to make the learning plan twice a year. So we're doing all that, and it has been very powerful. Um, so I'm glad people brought that up. It kind of um, validated what we're doing, so that was cool. Um, we don't have any, I think the other thing I wasn't maybe clear about was we have all of our students apply to colleges. We have 100% of our seniors apply to four-year. 100% of them fill out the FAFSA every year. We have very little problem with getting we have a really good tracking system for like getting kids. Um, mm -hmm. The problem we're noting is that kids are not being successful or not going, and a lot of it's because of the financial aid piece or because their skills really are too low, and we want to kind of get some of those kids to do a transfer program. And a lot of our kids don't, I think, because we've unintentionally made them think they have to go to a four-year first. So now we're trying to be like, yes, apply to these four years, but if you're testing really low, let's put you into the transfer program at an excellent community college. So we're not having a struggle with getting kids accepted or to apply. It's really it's getting them to navigate the system and actually be to go and complete um, those lower skilled students. And I feel like maybe I wasn't super clear about that. And I think my other takeaway is I'm wondering if maybe we had the wrong um, question for today. After this conversation, I'm like, oh, maybe we had the wrong question. I'm not sure what the question should have been, but <laughs> I wish... Um, I don't know, I wish we had more time, I guess. But I'm really excited about having more conversations with students and about thinking about how to measure navigation. I think that is very, very powerful. We do have alumni come in and meet with our students already, and we're, we're going to continue to do that. I really like the idea of having them share, um, I think who has said it? I think Daisy said it, yeah, having alumni come in or talking to alumni who didn't go to college and really finding out why. I keep track of all of our alumni and I know that a lot of them aren't in college, but I don't really ask a lot of them why. So that's another thing, like asking alumni why. Great. 
Thank you for sharing those takeaways. And you also kind of started us into the debrief portion, which is actually a really important part of this. No, it's great. A really important part of this process because we want to continue kind of getting better at these conversations. And part of that is debriefing the process and how it worked for us. Um, so if we could go to the debrief slide, this is a chance for us to kind of turn away from the actual content of what we've been discussing and really just focus in on how did this process feel to us, knowing that, of course, there's the added layer of doing this virtually and that technology adds the wrinkle. So let's take, let's take the wrinkle of, it's really hard to stay in the room out of that because we know that's, that's an issue. Um, but as far as this process, um, did we actually, maybe we can start with, did we answer your question, Jessica? And and you you mentioned like wishing it was a different question. Do you want to say a little bit more about that? Or we can move on into how other folks experience this process too. Um, I feel like maybe I just didn't word the question well. I think that onus is definitely on me. Um, I think I, I'm, I am, I, I don't remember who brought it up. Someone brought up, um, I don't know, Kara. Um, that the group is so small already, and it makes it troubling um, in terms of data. And like, I'm a, I'm a science teacher, and we do a lot of data collection in my science classes. And I'm like, this is too small of a data set. Like, it's driving. Me I mean, you talk about little d data being good, but I'm like, like four seniors of that workshop. I'm like, that's really little d data. So uh, I, I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I'm really like, I don't know what exactly we're measuring. Um, so I think I wish I'd asked a little more clearly, like. What other things would should we measure? I think maybe I could have said that. Okay, great. And that I would say is a very common experience of these protocols. You often realize that it's a different question at the end than you thought that you had going into it. So that's a very common experience, also. Um, any other? I'd love to just hear from. How about four people? Just kind of pop out about what you noticed or experienced in this process suggestions, ways we can make it better, moments when the conversation really seemed to take a turn for the better? Well, I just want to shout out your facilitation, Stacey. I think the way you line people up for uh, giving feedback or questions um, helped the conversation to flow. And it didn't feel stilted at all, even though a lot of times the sort of online dialogue is really challenging. Um, I think you kept the pace really well, so um, it felt breezy. <laughs> oh, great. That's good to hear. I always worry about putting people on the spot, so thank you. Anybody else feel free to contradict that, too? No, I, w I would agree with that. <laughs> I think it was good to, to kind of... The, like my, I think that... Um, I think that the question was like a little bit... It, it, in terms of, I think that I, I think I, I would have, I think I would agree that the question wasn't necessarily quite the right. Que like it seemed like a little bit of a the 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 scale of the question didn't quite seem like I had enough to contribute because it, be, I mean, I, I think to the point of like maybe there were other things that they could have been measuring that I think that shift in the question would have been helpful. But as a result, so I didn't feel like I was necessarily had a lot I could contribute to the conversation. But the fact that you kind of kept us moving along and asking us to, you know, participate in and like kind of lining us up. That I think that was very helpful in terms of the process. I think that um so it's the maybe the question was the wrong question. I'm not sure. I actually do think though the question of how to do measures in this process mm -hmm. is something that lots of people are finding perplexing. So I think it was I personally I, I thought it was a great dilemma. I although I think a lot of the conversation led to good possible change ideas or drivers and less about measures, although there was some, there was some input on the measures. And one other thought about during clarifying questions, I wonder if we just should have a standard, what's the list of things you're already doing that you just want to shout out there so we try not to repeat those things. And that might have avoided us talking about things that we now know Jessica, the school already does. That's a great suggestion. I love just adding that in as like the first question to get us going. What are you already doing? Great. All right. And I and I want to uh, a possible 
a, a potential fix for kind of like, is this the right question? Is I think as a facilitator, I could have jumped in before the discussion portion and and just said, Jessica, like looking at this, these questions, does this still feel like the right question or has it kind of shifted for you? That might have been like a nice thing to do to give the opportunity to shift that question. So that's something you can try in future ones as well. Great. Well, unless people have other debriefs, feel free to check in any more ideas, suggestions, because we're always tweaking this and making it better, um, we hope. So I do want to kind of just highlight a few things that are coming up before we all go. We're going to be done before 4.15, so well done, CCCR group. Um, but we wanted to just highlight a few things that are on the horizon. So. Next month, we've got Connect Ed is going to be sharing their work in an improvement review March 10th, um, same time, same place. So be on the lookout for an invitation to that, but mark your calendars. And we would love to have um, each team lead bring at least one team member. We actually can have more people in the room than we realized were possible on Google Hangouts. And it's really valuable to have other members of your team kind of offering their perspectives. So please recruit and invite. Um, if you haven't yet, we would love your help in encouraging your team members to fill out that logistics form because we want to make sure um, that we get everybody a bed in the hotel because it is quickly filling up um, with deeper learning participants. So we want to make sure everybody has a place to stay. So if you could kind of um, gently harass your fellow teammates about completing that form, that would be great. Um, and we just want to say a thank you to everybody who a lot of folks are using your team's folders that we set up um, from the winter convening and using that to capture your learning through PDSAs. Um, and that's fantastic. Please keep doing that. It's really helpful to us to be able to click on your PDSAs and see what you're working on and what your driver diagram is. We do want to highlight this PDSA reflection protocol that's in very draft form. I know Michael used kind of a, our initial version of it and found it helpful um, and suggested some great tweaks. And we also wanted to just encourage team lead folks to be in, in conversations with your team, thinking about like what are those things that you can track over time to see if you're making progress on, on your aim or not. So things like confidence level or belonging or things that you could be tracking um, regardless of what you're trying but that really get at the stuff that you care about. As much as you can help your teams think about those as possible measures, that would be great. Um, and we're, of course, happy to help brainstorm around that stuff as well. So that's just the things moving forward. Does anybody have any questions, clarifications, or like things that you're learning about improvement that you just want to shout out and share with folks? Because we, we're 10 minutes early. That never happens. We have a moment. Well, I just want to say it's a privilege to be a part of these. So thanks for inviting me, Stacy. <clears throat> well, we love having eight Robs at these things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Every time I reload, it's it's like I'm reloading with another version of me. I don't know. I know we get like Rob cubed, Daisy squared. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah. But we always get a different pose with Rob, so it actually feels like one of those like glamour shots. We feel like <laughs> pondering something differently, so I I quite enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, feel free to reach out to us with questions, resources, things to share. Thank you very much, um, Pierre, Kira, Jose, Jessica, Jennifer, for joining us today. It's really awesome to have you here, and we hope that you'll join us for future ones, too. So thank next month, Connect Ed. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.